Hi, everyone. It's uh, Russ Thornton with Wealth Care for Women. Today, I am uh, excited to share another educational webinar uh, with my friends at Caribou. Uh, I'm joined by Christine Simone. She's the CEO and co-founder of Caribou. And uh, if you haven't seen any of these educational webinars in the past, Caribou is a uh, a super important partner in the work that I do for my clients in helping uh, my clients and I evaluate their healthcare needs, uh, both in terms of cost and coverage, but also wrapping that information into their financial plan so we can look at what those costs might look like and the impact they might have both short term and long term. So with that, I, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Christine. Christine, happy, happy to do this with you today. Really glad to be here. It's always a pleasure to be able to work with you and supporting your clients through a very complex subject matter. And today is certainly no exception. We're going to be talking about the sandwich generation and ways in which we can start to plan for some expected costs uh, that could incur for anyone who is finding themselves in that sandwich generation. And we'll get into exactly what the definition of that is uh, soon. But in case you haven't watched a webinar or interacted with Caribou in the past, Again, I'm Christine and Caribou is a healthcare planning software specifically for clients that work with financial advisors. If you have any questions about what we do, feel free to reach out directly to Russ and he'll be sure to provide you with information and depending on your situation, potentially uh, connect us with one another. And today we're going to be talking about a very important subject because it impacts a lot of individuals. We'll get into you know how many people that is, but the sandwich generation places a huge, not only financial burden, but also emotional and physical burden on Americans across the country. So hopefully by the end of today, you'll be able to get out some strategies and some tips and some planning oriented data points that can help you better prepare uh, for that if you are nearing that or perhaps find yourself in the sandwich generation today. We'll be talking through life expectancy, what that really means and the ways in which those numbers have changed over the course of years. We'll talk about the sandwich generation and what that really means and then jump into some strategies both to assist with aging parents and then to assist with children. So to kick things off here, there's a part of the reason and why this is such an important subject to talk about is because of the shifts that are happening in life expectancy. In the early 1900s, life expectancy in the United States was actually 47 years old. And by 2014, it had almost doubled to nearly 80 years old. So people are living a lot longer than expected. And something that a lot of individuals don't necessarily understand or know about life expectancy is you actually have a 50% chance of surpassing your life expectancy. So it's actually a median number uh, that is projected based on a bunch of different data po points that I'll, I'll show you in the next couple of slides. But even if your life expectancy is, let's say, 70 or 75, again, there is a 50% chance that you might actually surpass that number. So this is a really big reason as to why we're finding more and more individuals in the sandwich generation is because grandparents are living a lot longer and therefore it's more likely that as a parent you might be expected to take care of mom or dad. Additionally, the longer that you live, it's more and more likely that you will actually live longer. So anybody who actually reaches the age of 65 can expect to live another 19 years. I recently attended um, a conference and I don't remember the specific number, but I was very surprised to hear that I believe the average age for a widow is actually in their mid to late 50s. And Russ, you might be able to confirm this. It was certainly a lot younger than I had thought that it was, and that kind of goes hand in hand with this statistic about once you reach age 65, it's actually more likely that you will in fact live longer. Yeah, I don't remember the exact age either, Christine, but I've seen a similar stat and I was equally surprised that it was in the it was in the mid to late 50s. And I'm assuming that also includes uh, uh, widows who lose spouses in wartime and things like that. So there's a lot of contributing factors. But yeah, I was I was surprised and 
those widows specifically have a lot of years ahead of them that they need to plan for. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's the that's the key point to this is that uh, there there will be lots of years ahead to to plan for. So this has been a big part of why we're seeing more and more individuals in the sandwich generation. And we can actually expect about 600,000 people to be alive over the age of 100 by the year 2060. So in the next 35 or so years, we're going to reach almost, you know, over half a million people who are over the age of 100 and still living. And for sake of comparison, you know, today we have somewhere in and around 100,000 people who are over the age of 100 and still living. So that number is expected to roughly, let's say, 6x. And a lot of that is because of lifestyle changes, novel therapeutics and medications and advances in technology that are helping people to live longer. A lot of people believe that genetics and gender are actually, if not the main thing, the only thing that contribute to longevity, but there are actually a lot of other factors too that come into play and are really important to consider as you are financially planning. For example, your access to healthcare, which goes in part with where you live, hygiene, diet and nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, and Interestingly enough, but it does have an impact, uh, crime rates, um, because it impacts you by matter of chance in the event that you're in an area that might not necessarily be as safe, for example. So if you are you know, planning your retirement and considering your relocation, that might be something that might actually impact uh, your longevity because it might impact your access to healthcare, for example. Hopefully it impacts it in a positive way. Hopefully also you have a better lifestyle post-retirement. So just as these life events are happening and as you might be revisiting different longevity estimates for you and your financial plan, know that there are more factors than just your genetics and gender, which don't necessarily change throughout the course of your life, uh, that also come into play and could have an impact in your longevity as well. Now to get into really the crux of what we're going to be talking about today, which is the sandwich generation and key financial strategies to be able to support the, the sandwich generation. Unlike millennials or baby boomers, which are other terms that you might be familiar with, the sandwich generation actually doesn't, um, isn't defined by which decade you were born in. So it's not necessarily if you were born between, you know, the 1970s to 1990s, then you're in the sandwich generation. Um, but that is typically in and around the age that we're seeing individuals in the sandwich generation today. Uh, but that range will change as um, our generations do grow up. So what the sandwich generation is defined by is that if you have a child under the age of 18, living at home, and an aging parent over the age of 65, that requires some type of support either emotional, physical, or financial. And today we're really going to be digging in to the financial piece of that and providing some strategies around those areas. Today, about 30% of Americans fall in the sandwich generation. And that number has ebbed and flowed over the course of recent years and will continue to uh, be modified over coming years as well based on some factors as are listed on this slide. For example, family structure. Back in the day, it was a lot more common that parents might move into the house to help out with um, a newborn baby, for example, or their, their grandchildren. This is still very common in other parts of the world, but much less so in the Americas. And so that is something that does impact um, the burden that's placed on somebody in the in the uh, sandwich generation because they live close to mom or dad, the financial component of what they are taking care of isn't necessarily impacting a separate domicile, a separate house where they might need to look into equipment modifications or driving over there and taking care of medications and things of that nature. It all happened under one roof. Additionally, people are having babies later and later. Uh, people are marrying later in life as well. And so grandparents are a lot older when their kids are born. 
which also impacts the amount of time that individuals in the sandwich generation would need to care for a child as well as an aging parent. Inflation is certainly a hot topic in the last year or two, especially healthcare costs. Typically, the rate of inflation grows uh, faster than the average rate of inflation, and as well as college tuition is seeing really big spikes too. So that's certainly impacting the financial burden placed on individuals in the sandwich generation. And then job security and work policies as it relates to multi-generational multi support. You might actually have benefits uh, for parental leave, for example, or other parental related benefits, but you actually might have caregiver related benefits as well. These are certainly newer and a very positive thing that can help if you do find yourself in the sandwich generation. When you consider the specific costs that typically speaking individuals are responsible for when caring for a child or an aging parent, typically it falls into the six categories here on this slide. You might have healthcare, transportation, housing, college, food, insurance, and any other discretionary costs like lifestyle choices or travel. You might be responsible for paying for a family vacation, for example, with grandparents and your children. So these are the sorts of things that typically speaking are a financial responsibility of an individual in the sandwich generation. And because our expertise is on the health insurance side, uh, what we're going to be diving into specifically today is three areas or three areas where to live, assessing the preferences and putting a plan in place early for where your aging parents can live, how to help aging parents with their either established Medicare coverage or as they're transitioning into Medicare coverage at 65, and then also coverage for younger adults as well as students. So if you have those children aged under the age of 16 or 18 per the definition of the sandwich generation, but this actually applies for any children up to the age of 26 as well who still might be living under your roof. And so we are gonna be able to touch on um, those um, that category of children as well. So SKU sort of health insurance theme, that is again, the expertise here at Caribou, but based on the slide prior, again, this is not an exhaustive list of strategies or all encompassing of all of the expectations uh, that you might have financially as someone in the sandwich generation. Uh, so do make sure that you are looking into strategies and uh, rest would be a great resource to talk about uh, those other areas with as well. In addition to that, this is not financial advice. Uh, there are going to be some strategies shared as well as some average costs shared. Russ is the best resource for you to go to if you are looking for specific financial advice as to how to approach your specific situation. And what we're talking about today is just very general averages for the most part. So do confirm any strategy directly with Russ if you're interested in digging a little bit deeper into specific expected costs for you. Now, this is a, always a, a really interesting and a sort of painful statistic to, to have to read out. Uh, there was frequently studies conducted that ask individuals who and how they would pay for long-term care for their parents. And typically speaking, a lot of people usually respond, which is no exception with this survey that was recently run by Policy Genius. People respond saying that they will use Medicare to pay for long term costs. Other individuals said they would pay for it themselves out of pocket or they don't know who well, or how they would pay for it. A really big misconception is that Medicare doesn't pay for long term care. So that is something to keep in mind as you are planning for caring for your parents if you are responsible financially to support them. If they don't have their own financial plan in place, that burden might fall on you. And something really, really important to take away from this webinar, if anything, is that Medicare does not pay for long-term care. So we're going to talk about just a couple of kind of ranges and averages that you can expect depending on if your client, your parents rather, plan to age in place or age in a facility. 
if they are aging at home, it's their preference to stay in a home, whether that's their house or moving in with you. Typically, that type of a setting is a lot more independent and a lot more familiar. And you can have a really good support system, typically through friends, neighbors, and family. However, upgrades to a residence can cost anywhere from $10,000 to $100,000, depending on what you need done. Let's take into account a couple examples. If you have stairs leading up to your front door, you might need to install a ramp. If you have a bathtub or a very low toilet, those are things that might require some equipment or stairs in the house to get them to get up to a bedroom. Maybe there needs to be a bedroom installed on in the main floor. So these are all different types of upgrades to your house that you might expect as your parents are aging if their preference is to age in place or at home. In addition to that, if parents require any type of caregiver services, whether that is just a few hours a day or around the clock, that can range on average from about $4,000 to about $18,000 a month. So that is something that you will need to take into account for things like activities of daily living, like bathing or eating, dressing, medications, things of that nature is typically what caregiver services are required for. On the flip side of that, you have residential options, uh, which can also be considered as facility-based aging. This can be relatively independent if you are in your own room. Um, however, a lot of shared accommodations do exist. It's also known as assisted living or long-term care custodial care or skilled nursing facilities, which is what SNF stands for. This setting is typically more social. There might be organized gatherings, you know, game nights, meals that you'll have with people, and the facilities themselves are all accessible. So if you can't climb stairs, for example, you will have elevator access, ramp access, or a room on the main floor. So you don't have to worry for the most part about individual accommodations for your parents if they need them done in a residential option. Now, assisted living can range in and around about $3,700 a month, and then skilled nursing, which typically, typically requires more hands-on care, is over double that price, about $8,700 a month. So these are the two options. Again, very high level. These ranges and estimates will differ depending on where you live and the type of care and support uh, that is required for your parents. But these are some good numbers and some good talking points to keep in mind and even to start to have with your parents as they are aging to get a sense for what their preference is now so that you can start to plan accordingly for some of these expenses. As it relates to long-term care, I mentioned that Medicare does not cover long-term care expenses. So going through what Medicare actually covers is its own webinar in and of itself. And we will be uh, hosting a webinar in the months of open enrollment, which run from October uh, through the early part of December with Russ. So do tune into that and learn about ways that you can optimize your parents' Medicare coverage or your own or plan for your own Medicare coverage in the future in the fall months. But we're only going to really scratch the surface right now when it comes to what Medicare actually does cover. The easiest way to ease yourself into this conversation with your parents is to help them with the initial decision of figuring out how they want to configure their Medicare coverage at the age of 65. And then you can become a resource for them on an ongoing basis as their health needs change or they're looking to optimize their coverage on a year over year basis, which you can do during open enrollment. If you are helping your parents with this decision, it's really important to know that there are two ways that you can configure your Medicare coverage. The first is original Medicare, which is the left side of this uh, flow chart here. Original Medicare includes Parts A and Part B, which are hospital and medical insurance, respectively, 
and then you add a prescription drug plan, which is also known as Part D, and then you add a supplemental plan, which is also known as Medigap. Depending on where you live, you might have, you likely have lettered plans, like a Plan G, for example, which is a Medigap plan, or you might be in a state that has a slightly different system where you have plan names like Core or Supplemental uh, in just, just a handful of states that have a little bit of a different system. So you might be familiar with that terminology too. Original Medicare grants you a lot more flexibility in which doctors you see. About 97 to 98% of doctors accept Original Medicare, which is one of the really key differences between Original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. You do, though, have to keep three different cards in place because you're kind of um, constructing your coverage bit by bit. So you'll have a card for Parts A and B, you'll have a, a card for Part D, your prescription drug coverage, and then you'll also have a supplemental card. So you'll have three different cards to manage in that case. Medicare Advantage on the other side, which is also known as Part C, is bundling everything together and supplied by a private insurance company. So typically speaking, this is Part A, Part B, as well as the equivalent of a supplemental plan and Part D all bundled into one. You do want to make sure that your selected Medicare Advantage plan does include prescription drug coverage because some plans do come without because if you don't enroll, in a plan with prescription drug coverage when you turn 65, you could be exposed to a late enrollment penalty in the future if you need that drug coverage. Again, there's actually a lot of differences and I'll discuss one more on the next slide, but we will be running a separate webinar as it relates specifically to Medicare in the fall. So I don't wanna to spend too, too much time here on the details. The main point is that there are so many options. So, so many options to consider when you're first initially enrolling in Medicare, as well as on an ongoing basis during open enrollment to optimize the coverage. And you wanna be thinking not just about your parents at 65, but hopefully the next 50 years. If they do live for 50 more years, what's the most optimal coverage configuration for them? Because if you choose Medicare Advantage at the onset, you will need to go through medical underwriting if you then wanna transfer over to original Medicare. The reverse, though, going from original Medicare to Medicare Advantage does not require medical underwriting. So you do want to keep that in mind. You also want to keep in mind which facilities and doctors you want access to. I mentioned that about 98% of doctors accept original Medicare. That is not true for Medicare Advantage. You will be limited to a network much like your employer coverage or your current marketplace coverage works today, where you either have an HMO or a PPO or an EPO, and you have a specific network that you need to stay in. So you wanna be thinking about which facilities and doctors you want access to. In addition to that, you wanna anticipate higher healthcare utilization and that your risk tolerance as well as your income is likely to change as you age. When you retire, you might not be producing as much income from a salary, for example. It might just be investment income, social security. And so you do want to take that into account when you are considering your budget for coverage. One of the other really key differences between Original Medicare and Medicare Advantage is the total risk exposure. And that is something to keep in mind as it relates to the point of healthcare utilization changing as you age. So on this chart here, you do uh, want to keep in mind the associated out-of-pocket maximum costs with Medicare Advantage in comparison to the associated possible out-of-pocket with original Medicare. A lot of advertisements promote that Medicare Advantage is free, that you pay nothing up front. But as you can see here, you're actually still paying for your Part D premium, which is adjusted based on your income. And you might not have a premium for the Medicare Advantage plan specifically, but you will have the income adjustment on the Part D drug coverage. And then you will also have this out-of-pocket maximum, which is typically speaking a lot higher than any out-of-pocket costs that you might incur on original Medicare. So a lot of people get swayed when they're 65 
by thinking that I'm young, I'm healthy, I don't access a lot of healthcare services. So I think Medicare Advantage is the best option for me. I'm going to sign up for that now, and then I can change that in the future. But again, remember, you have to go through medical underwriting if you want to go from Medicare Advantage to Original Medicare in the future. So that is something that you want to make sure your parents understand, or if you yourself are you know, nearing this transition, that you understand uh, as you're making this initial selection. Original Medicare, though, will have higher upfront costs. You'll see here upfront costs of about $550 versus $372 a month, but that total risk factor is a lot lower than it is on Medicare Advantage. So that's a really, really key thing to help your parents sort through as they are making this initial decision. And then as they continue to see advertisements or get mail or emails or even people knocking on their door, trying to convince them to switch to Medicare Advantage. We've heard a lot of stories, unfortunately, of um, you know, very aggressive marketing campaigns from agents or directly from carriers to encourage seniors to switch over to Medicare Advantage, as well as, of course, the rate of scams is increasing a lot. Know that Medicare will never call you nor your parents and ask you to switch plans. Those are scams, and you want to be able to help your parents identify those types of scams as um as best as possible. And if you're involved in this initial decision with them, it's likely that they'll come back to you if they do get a call like this, for example, and hopefully confirm any switch that they're going to make with you so that you can help assess whether or not that is in their best interests uh, financially and, and based on their health needs. The best resources are always government related resources when it comes to Medicare. So if your parents are getting emails or browsing the internet and, you know, finding uh, information that is not from a government resource, try to direct them uh, to a government resource to second check that information. Again, Russ is a good resource or we can be a good resource as well if you have questions related to switching health plans. Again, if you're interested in a more deep dive into Medicare, please come to the webinars or look at the webinars if you're watching this recording that will happen in the fall because we'll go deeper and deeper into Medicare in those months. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about strategies for kids uh, between the ages of actually not only 18 to 26, but just consider this to be under the age of 26 um, for, for any kids still living at home. Two key strategies that we're going to talk about today. The first is about premium tax credits. The American Rescue Act was enacted as a result of the pandemic. It's been extended into 2025, which is great news. And what it's done is it has brought the income level for premium tax credits. It has actually increased it. Um, so the premium tax credit income level used to be based on a certain poverty level, and it's increased that uh, poverty levels so that individuals now with higher income can be eligible for a premium tax credit that helps them subsidize part of the cost of their marketplace plan premium. So if you are enrolled on a plan via the marketplace, which is in most states, healthcare.gov. Um, however, in other states like New York or Pennsylvania or California, they have state specific marketplaces. Uh, then this tax credit can apply to you. So more people are eligible than ever before. It lowers the premiums when the tax credits are applied, and it's based on your zip code, the size of your household, and your total household income. So again, this is a helpful strategy if you have kids under the age of 26 still living at home, but also if you have kids who are moving out have their own income, file their own tax return, but you're still financially responsible for helping them with things like their health insurance. And I'll get into a strategy uh, that demonstrates that too. Before I do though, ways to claim your premium tax credit is to either claim it in advance by estimating this year's current expected income. So we're in July 2023 right now. If you have a good sense of what your income is going to be for the entirety of the year, you can actually claim your tax credit on a month by month basis. 
or if you do not know what that income is going to be because maybe you or your children are in between jobs, uh, maybe your income is fluctuating because of retirement or other reasons like investments, then you can actually opt to pay the full price now and then reconcile any differences when you file your taxes um, in 2024 for the 2023 year. So you'll get money back. It's always nicer to get money back than it is to have to pay money uh, later on. So you do want to uh, keep that in mind as you are uh, going through uh, claiming this premium tax credit. The eligibility for the premium tax credit are that you need to be enrolled in a marketplace plan. You need to be a U.S. citizen or legal resident. You need to file federal income tax returns. You cannot qualify for Medicaid or Medicare, and you cannot be eligible for an employee plan that offers minimum essential coverage, which is most of employee plans offered. So to say that in other words, if your employer is offering you a plan and you don't take it, typically speaking, you cannot then go and, on the marketplace and claim a premium tax credit because you do have an option offered to you through an employer. So this is typically best for individuals who are retired. So if you yourself are in the same generation and you're retired, you can claim, typically speaking, a premium tax credit. Or if your children have not yet formally launched from the, from the house and have a job that offers an employer plan, or maybe they're a student and they're offered a student health plan, but they don't like it, then they can actually qualify for a premium tax credit as well. So keep these eligibility criteria in mind. Now, this is the example that I mentioned briefly that highlights how you can apply a premium tax credit either as a household or on an individual basis for your children. And I do encourage you, you yourself, or work through Russ and us to be able to paint out different scenarios that can help to highlight what makes the most sense for you and your child or children based on the premium tax credits offered in your specific geography and your income. Again, uh, the premium tax credit is based off of where you live, the size of the household, and the total household income. And if you have a child um, that is not yet income producing, they actually might qualify for Medicaid on their own. So you don't necessarily want to assume that dropping them off the plan and enrolling them in a separate plan on their own is the best case scenario. Because again, if they have no income themselves, they usually qualify for Medicaid and therefore are not eligible for a premium tax credit on their own. While I don't have a specific threshold because it does depend per state and the plans offered in the specific geography, typically speaking, we see an income anywhere between 15000 to maybe 25000 being the minimum that you would need to not qualify for Medicaid. So if you have a child with a part-time job, for example, hopefully that brings them over the threshold where they can actually access a premium tax credit rather than qualifying for Medicaid or Medicaid might also be the better option depending on the coverage offered in your state. To kind of walk you through this example here, you can see this first um, cost comparison here is a plan offered in a specific uh, county to a family that has multiple individuals on it. And the total premium is $682 with the tax credit applied. If you remove the tax credit, it's about $1,200. So the total tax credit is about $550 for that household. If I remove one person from the policy, you can see that the total premium went up and the tax credit went way down. So we have now a plan that has a premium of $750 with that tax credit applied because that tax credit is now only about $250. So you can actually play around with the costs on the individual marketplace. Or again, Caribou can help with that if you want to go through Russ to be able to paint out different scenarios here of what expected costs could be with and without dependents. Typically, we do run this scenario. If you have a child that you're still covering around the ages of 24, 25, and then they're aging off the policy at 26, you'll probably want to map out the two different scenarios of what the expected costs 
might be for you yourself and then for your children so that you can appropriately financially plan for those two different costs. In addition to that, if you have children under the age of 26 who are on their own plan, you might want to consider an HSA. Again, please don't take this as financial advice. Discuss directly with Russ uh, what strategy might work best for your child or even for you if you are considering contributing to an HSA. But an HSA is a great investment account, has triple tax benefits, contributions are tax deductible, savings grow tax deferred and withdrawals for H HSA eligible expenses are tax free. This year you can contribute about $3,800 as an individual or about $7,700 as a family. One really key thing to keep in mind with an HSA, you need to be on a high deductible plan to have access to an HSA and contribute to an HSA. And what that means is that if you have a high deductible plan, you are exposed to more in possible out-of-pocket costs. So your premium might be a lot lower, but your out-of-pocket costs might be higher. So let's look on this slide here at what exactly that means. In these first two columns, you have two HSA compatible plans. You have one that's a lower cost, um, not a name brand. Ambetter isn't a very recognized uh, carrier name, but Cigna is, so we've shown here two examples to kind of highlight what the cost differences might be. In this case, the cost difference isn't actually much. Um, so it's um, a good thing if you're interested in that recognized carrier rather than more of a no name brand. It's only about an extra $10 a month. But you can see here the deductible is quite high and then the out of pocket maximum is typically usually equivalent to the out of pocket or to the deductible rather or in and around the same amount. You are responsible for paying up to $6,900 or $6,100 until your plan even starts to pay anything. So that is something to keep in mind. And that is why if you're on a higher deductible plan, that's a strategy that is typically recommended for healthier individuals. If you are a high healthcare utilization, um, if you have a high healthcare utilization or your children have very high demanding healthcare needs, even though the HSA is a great investment account, it might not be the most optimal financial decision for you. So do consider that as you are selecting health plans, either for yourself in retirement, pre-Medicare eligibility, or for your children. That is something to keep in mind. You can see this last column here shows a low deductible option. The premium has gone up, but the deductible has gone down. So that is typically something to consider. If you consider the worst case financial responsibility, you've increased potential costs by about $4,000 a year. So that may or may not be a risk that you are uh, willing to take, depending on yours or your child's healthcare needs. That sort of wraps up the key strategies uh, that I wanted to walk through today. Again, the strategies that we talked about were mostly financially related as well as mostly health insurance related. That is not all encompassing of the other categories that you may or may not need to help to fund financially for your aging parents or for your children. And certainly we didn't really talk much about the emotional or physical burden that being in the sandwich generation can also place on you majority of individuals who are part of this generation do feel very stressed or somewhat stressed about the financial obligations that they need to uh, take on for their parents or for their kids. So do make sure that you are considering all of the other areas that you might need to take into account. Talk to your financial advisor about those other categories like college or like long-term care or transportation and housing that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, as well as discuss matters like a will, end of life wishes, and any estate planning matters. Talk about uh, finances openly with your family. Again, something that I mentioned on the Medicare slide, but applies across the board to any, any topic area in this um, sandwich generation topic is talk about it as soon as possible. Start the conversation early and do become that resource for either your kids or your parents to come to so that you can have a good sense for what those expected costs might be in the event that you do need to take them on. 
and then do make time for yourself as well. Um, based on the longevity estimates and the way in which longevity has increased over the years, you do need to make sure that any support that you're providing is sustainable for your parents or for your children. So again, do take time for yourself, talk to your financial advisor, seek other community resources that might be available to you depending on where you live or online like AARP or the Department of Health and Human Services and even your HR department. I mentioned that there are some caregiving or parental related benefits that can be offered via your HR department or benefits policy. So do make sure to check into that as well as speak to any tax professional um, when it comes to possible additional tax deductions. So for example, if you are making accommodations to your home, you might be able to claim that on your taxes as well. At the end of the day, um, one person's situation, meaning what they might expect to spend uh, for their parents or their, for their kids is much different than somebody else's. So do plan for the unexpected. There is no crystal ball. It is very hard to predict longevity. And so you do want to make sure uh, that you are taking into account various scenarios and also frequently revisiting the plan that you have in place and openly having that conversation with uh, your, your parents or with your kids. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Russ, if you have any additional comments um, to make or opportunities for clients to possibly do a health planning analysis to start to plan out the different scenarios that they might be responsible for financially. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Um, this is great. And you touched on several topics, which, uh, as you mentioned, could be a webinar in and of themselves, um, some of which we'll be addressing uh, in coming months, um, one of which is long-term care. So um, you mentioned uh, Medicare does not cover long-term care. Um, and again, we could, this is a, a deep rabbit hole, but um, I, yeah. I would just love to get your like um, high level thoughts. Like what are some other ways clients can address long-term care needs like financially? Um, what are your thoughts on long-term care insurance? Do you think it's worth it? Um, and you mentioned an HSA with a high deductible plan. Is that, is that something, a, res a resource someone could use to, to maybe pay for long-term care insurance, for example? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I like to say, and I was stealing this from an advisor who once said it to me, but I, I can't remember who it was. Uh, it was a while ago that um, you don't necessarily need a long-term care plan, meaning the actual policy itself, but you need a plan for long-term care. So whether you're going to buy a policy or fund it yourself, you need to have a plan in place, whichever of the two options that is. Typically speaking, long-term care insurance is worth it, but the number one concern is the cost. And typically people are looking into it too late when the costs are very high and people are afraid to commit to it sooner when it can be a lot less expensive. Um, so don't try to game that. I think that if you know that you are going to be purchasing long-term care insurance either for yourself or paying for it on the behalf of your parents, um, possibly commit to that sooner rather than later so that you can have advantages in what that premium might be for that policy. And if anything, just put a plan in place. Know how you are going to be funding it, whether that's through a policy or uh, whether that's through an investment account or you know a, a certain amount that you set aside to pay for it. It's estimated that around 70% of people need some type of long-term care, but only 10% actually have a policy or plan for it. So you want to make sure that you are taking that into account. And I, I like that you tied this back around to uh, the HSA and the high deductible plan because you can, in fact, use your HSA funds to pay for long-term care premiums. So that is something to keep in mind that if you are funding an HSA account, a qualified expense is to actually pay for long-term care insurance premiums. So those two strategies or those two topic areas sort of do go hand in hand. All right, got it, thanks. Um, and then shifting gears away from so much the parents and, and thinking back to children um, below age 26. So let's say, let's say that someone is watching this, they've got a student that goes to college out of state. How does a marketplace plan and its coverage work if their dependent is, again, in school, out of state, in a different jurisdiction, a different you know, geography? How does the coverage and uh, how does all that work? 
Great question again. So if you're still claiming them as a tax dependent, then you can file and enroll in the plan. You just include yourself as a non-covered person and you can include your income and then add them as a dependent. So the plan would cover them, but the premium tax credit would be based off of your salary. So if you do it that way, they would consider your salary as the parent and they may or may not be eligible for that tax credit. So again, if your child does have some income and doesn't qualify for Medicaid, it might be advantageous for the dependent to enroll on their own if they're between the ages of 18 to 26. They can do that and they might have a $0 premium for their plan, which may or may not be worthwhile. It depends on your specific circumstances. If you are no longer claiming the child as a dependent, uh, then the uh, child has to apply for their own coverage themselves and list themselves as the head of household and use their income as the estimate for that premium tax credit. Something that you do want to keep in mind is if children are in school, maybe they're in different states for parts of the year because of their college and where they live, they need to plan their coverage accordingly. So if you have an HMO plan locally that only covers certain doctors, likely that there are not doctors covered in a different state for your child. So you do want to take that into account if you are considering to put everybody on the same plan. Awesome. Thanks. One more, uh, one more question before we kind of wrap things up. So we've talked about um, the sandwich generation, taking care of aging parents, taking care of kids. What about the actual folks themselves? Um, what are some tips on how they can best optimize their own health care coverage? Yeah, I think that open enrollment is a great opportunity for everybody, whether it's yourself, your parents or your kids. Just ensuring that you are annually optimizing coverage is really, really important. There is so much going on. Again, we only really scratch the surface when it comes to the different areas financially, emotionally, and physically that people in the sandwich generation do um, need to take into account for their parents or kids. And so it can become really, really hard to think about your health insurance, but maybe set a reminder in your phone, an alert that can go off during open enrollment. Uh, that will remind you just to ensure to check over your coverage and your parents or kids coverage as well and make any adjustments needed. If you consider parents, for example, I think it's 90 to 95% of Medicare beneficiaries aren't on a plan that is most optimized for their current drug list. So if your mom or dad has gotten a new prescription drug in the last year, that's something that you want to make sure that you're revisiting with them in the months of October and November before open enrollment is over. Same applies for your children if they've gotten new doctors uh, or are in different states of the year because of school. Again, an opportunity to revisit coverage during open enrollment. And then for you yourself, if you're on an employer plan, your open enrollment season might be different. It might be in January. It might be in June. Uh, or it might fall in the fall months, just like for the marketplace and Medicare. So don't forget to take care of your own coverage as well during those months and run an analysis to be able to ensure that your health coverage is optimized too. Just like an investment strategy or a financial plan, you don't want your coverage to go stale if you leave it for too long. So make sure to revisit that and look at your explanation of benefits, any changes directly from your carriers regarding drug coverage or provider network coverage and know what your options are and the associated costs are. Speaking of uh, running an analysis and looking at your options, um, Christine and her colleagues at Caribou have been an indispensable partner and resource for my clients and I um, to uh, to address and evaluate those exact situations. So um, I've had a lot of clients that are either on Medicare or approaching Medicare eligibility um, work with uh, through, through myself, work with Caribou, Christine and her team to evaluate their options and look at original Medicare versus Advantage to consider both their drugs, their doctors, their preferred pharmacies to really make sure they're getting the best coverage and cost combination for their situation. I've also uh, worked with uh, Christine and her team to, um, uh, to help a client that is going through divorce um, evaluate COBRA coverage versus going out and getting uh, her own coverage through the marketplace. Um, and I've had other uh, scenarios. I've got a business owner that we looked at her situation to evaluate different uh, marketplace options for her. So I, I can't uh, sing uh, 
Caribou's praises highly enough. Um, they've been a tremendous partner um, and they really add a ton to the, uh, the expertise and the advice that I can bring to the table uh, for my clients. So um, I, I would encourage you to reach out to me uh, and uh, we can address uh, any of the scenarios that Christine's talked about during this webinar or what we've talked about in some of our past uh, presentations and what we'll certainly uh, discuss uh, in the coming months in future uh, presentations. So all that to say, uh, thank you, Christine. This has been great. Um, any closing comments or anything you'd like to add before we wrap it up today? No, I think I think you've summarized everything quite nicely. I think that you as, as their advisor are a fantastic resource. So if you have any questions related to anything that we went through, go directly to Russ. And if it makes sense for him to pass those questions on to us, we'd be happy to address, even if it falls slightly outside of the scope of the bandwidth of, of what we can help with, at least hopefully we can provide maybe some online resources to you. So um, hopefully, you know, don't be a stranger. We look forward to, to meeting with you um, one day soon or helping you out with one of these topics. And just don't forget to take care of yourself and talk about these subjects openly with your family members and as well as uh, your financial advisor. All right. Sounds good. Thanks again, Christine. This has been great. You're welcome. Thanks, Russ.